All right, here we are. Another episode of Web Derby Talk. This is an insane uh, episode because it's four fucking guests. Everybody introduce yourselves. Well, I'm Troy. Uh, Rich. Brian. And uh, the Who are three, you? The th I'm, I'm, I'm Gummo. Gummo. And, <laughs> you the three of these guys have uh, come together onto the show for uh, a very special celebration of one of the greatest albums ever to come out, Bubblegum by Mark Lanigan. And it is uh, celebrating the 20 year anniversary of this record that came out August 10th, 2004. And Lanigan, who is uh, no longer with us, which is uh, like brutal still to this day to even say, but he was a uh, a good friend of mine, and he's uh, was on the show two times, which a lot of times people say, what were some of your favorite episodes in the last 12 years? Hands down, the two with Land again were extremely uh, rare conversations, long format, and also amazing to see a different side of uh, Mark Land again. But if you are a big fan of him, or if you are not, you should be, because this guy was the only guy besides maybe Josh Homme that makes me feel a little uncomfortable because I feel like I I sometimes am like, I'm the real deal. And then these guys come around and you're kind of like, oh. <laughs> and that's really the honest truth. So let's get into it. Uh, Troy Van Leeuwen, of course, from Queens of the Stone Age and uh, an incredible story of doing these hotel room demos, which has really blown my mind, uh, that has finally come out from the bubblegum era. And then Brian and uh, Rich, who put all this together. So let's start kind of how this really happened. Well, so I'll, I'll start. <laughs> um, by the way, yeah, I think, I think um, your introduction, you know, mentioning two of my band members <laughs> try being in a bus with those guys um yeah for 24 hours uh seven days a week for about 19 months so yeah it's 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 i, I understand what you're saying um but you know um i'll just jump in and say you know when i joined the queens um you know it took a little while for me to get my footing and then you know after being in the band for a while, I just, I realized everybody was kind of doing the, their own side thing as well. You know, like Nick had Mondo Generator, you know, Josh had Desert Sessions, Lanigan had his own thing and, you know, um, and so Mark kind of, you know, he, he kind of started like, you know, approaching me about, you know, ideas that he had, you know, for these songs and, you know, he knew that I had recording gear with me all the time because I just do that on the road. I always have some kind of, you know, minimalistic recording situation. So he basically just started talking to me about, you know, these ideas, giving, you know, we'd be on a train ride somewhere, you know, and he'd be like, oh, I have this idea for this song. And he'd start spouting off some lyrics. So we just started talking about, you know, okay, well, I'm not really doing much outside of you know what you're doing so late at night about three in the morning and <laughs> you get a knock on the door and he's like i got this great idea um and so it would just be me and him and a microphone and a piece of guitar and that's how it all started what's amazing about that is as which by the way the box set the vinyl box set comes with an incredible book and i i would recommend just buying the box set just for the book yeah. But as I read your descriptions of Lanigan, you're on the Japanese Big Day Out tour. You have days off in between these uh, festivals and you're doing the bullet train tour and then you're getting these three in the morning knocks on the door. And I know that kind of work. There's this work where you're, you're in the middle of the night, you can't sleep, maybe you're on something, or you have demons and you you're like, I got, I got the idea now. And the minimalist minimalist of this, um, this demoing is incredible. And I could really feel 
uh, the rattle of Lanigan in your description as you're trying to do this drum loop with a beat on the floor. And he's like, I don't have time for this bullshit because the fucking idea is ready to go. And I've been there many times, especially back in the ADAT recording where people didn't know how to work ADATs and they're trying to sync up the machines and you're like, come on, just fucking go. So as you were describing that, I really felt Lanigan pacing around the room like, come on. Well, you know, surprisingly, yeah, I think some of your description is right because it's like, yeah, when you play the big day out and, and you've got hours or days to kill and you're just like, you're, you know, you're amped from the show, you know, or yeah, you're, you've had a little too much to drink or, you know, you're just kind of just like, what am I going to do with the next 17 hours? So, um, but you know, with, with him, you're right. You're absolutely right. He had no patience at all. And that's why there was no like extra, there was like maybe one extra guitar part. And uh, I would do a, an extra backing vocal or, or Nick would stop by and he would do the backing vocal on, on, you know, Wild Colorado because the night before at the Cherry Bar, him and me and Lanigan would get up and do a, a set of just acoustic shit of, of Lanigan stuff and some of Nick stuff. And it was just a kind of free for all environment where it's like, well, kind of anything goes. But with Lanigan, it was like, you're doing it wrong. Let's get it, get it right. It goes three this time, it goes five the next time, it goes back to C. So he had it all planned out in his head, surprisingly. And, you know, because I always just thought he was this poet singer that just kind of just did what he did. But it was all about the, the lyrics, and it's all about the rhythm that he had in his head. And there would be three chords at the most. So it's it's a bizarrely simple yet complex thing that he had, you know, but it always worked. Because when you got that voice, you kind of don't need much else. Yeah. I think the amazing thing about it was once he passed, you went back and found this hard drive and and like you said on the, in the box set, it was amazing that it even opened. Well, you know, I've got hard drives here all over, and you get them, and you're like, ah, this the, this is an old format. They don't make these cables anymore. We got to take it somewhere else, you know. And it opens up, and you find this gold. Now, once you find it, do you bring it to Rich or or Brian, or what happens? Well, kind of both. <laughs> First, I brought it to Brian because, you know, Brian and I have a long history together. Um, you know, when even before Lanigan, you know, I, I think even before Queens, I remember <clears throat> Brian. Well, we, you know, we worked on Enemy together. You know, that was my failure and failure. Yeah, you worked for, you know, for failure back then, too. You were like, what, 12? Of nine. <laughs> 13. Yeah. But, um, so we, we've had a relationship over the years. And uh, I think you called me maybe 2001 or something to do a Lanigan tour of Europe. Mm -hmm. And I just wasn't available or something. I was in the middle of, of a couple of things. So we, so, you know, Mark passes and we all, you know, get together and start reminiscing. And it just hits me like, a, literally like, like, Bolt. Like I have some stuff. I should just listen to it to make sure it's not terrible, you know? And I open it up and I'm like, oh, I could do all this cool shit to it. And I could just turn it into some track or something. And then after a while, it's just like the roughs that we did back then were so raw and so pure. And literally I burned him a CD and back then in 2003, February or March and we forgot about it. It was like, these are the ideas. And some of those ideas ended up being on the record. Some of them didn't. And so it just hit me like, I should just make sure this isn't total crap. And it was, it blew my mind. And so I think Brian, you were the first person I played it for because I was like, I knew that the 20 year anniversary was coming up for Bubblegum and it just kind of all fit together very easily, this whole idea. And so, and, and later on, you know, I, I talked to Rich at the 
at the uh, the memorial and we kind of hit it off for a second and then recently we've been talking a bunch about all this stuff and it's just been a really cool experience to find something that you thought you like if i didn't remember i don't know what, <laughs> if anyone yeah. no one would have remembered when no one knew about demos at all, even before just recording the album, he never said, hey, guys, here's some demos I'm thinking of recording. Never came up. So I, maybe he even forgot about them, but, you know, they were just lost and never known. Now, like Rich, said, when you were CDs back then, and it was like, here's a CD. <laughs> and that was it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And also, you know, once you kind of do a record, you don't even ever think about the old stuff yeah. uh, until something like this does happen and somebody breaks it out or even if they're still alive and it's a 20 year anniversary, that guy kind of got some stuff here that, you know, some sketches of some of the songs, you know. Now, yeah. Rich, when you hear this stuff, uh, what were your thoughts where you're like, oh my God, let's let's put this into the box set? Yeah, <clears throat> I mean, to me, uh, it was then and it still is now the highlight of the box set because it, it presents him in a form where he really is at his best. It's just his voice up front, you know, with some music and like it blew my mind when I opened them up and listened to them. And it was the same thing. There was a few things kind of kicked around and I was like, Dude, like this just needs not touching nobody fucks with it we just put it out the way it is because this is perfection like it's absolutely beautiful um it would have worked as a standalone release in itself it's that good you know we could have just put them out as a record and people would have loved it um but we were in the process of putting this thing together and it just felt like the perfect completion to them at that point in time so, uh, wow. Yeah, they were incredible, you know. I mean, <clears throat> the idea of the box, I mean, when Brian called me and said, Should, you know, have you thought about this? And we'd already been talking about it with Mark before he passed away because he knew that the anniversary was around there. And, you know, he said, like, that's the one. Like, I've got all of this material. That was the most creative period we sat on all this stuff. Like when that comes around, we should do something really nice for it. So we kind of talked through like a lot of that stuff. And when Brian kind of dug into his archive and we started digging through Beggar's archive and a bunch of other places, it was all there. You know, Brian had documented everything amazingly at the time, you know? So like, he's just pulling out gold after gold out of, you know, from under his house <laughs> it's all sad and um it was good because you know you don't want to just put out everything you know kind of that's there so we kind of went through it and luckily because we'd already discussed the idea with mark i kind of knew that there was some stuff that he didn't want going in it and some stuff that he did so it's not complete everything that was done at that point in time it's respectful to what he wanted it to be, you know, and um, we very, you know, were particular about going through it and making sure that what we were giving out is what he would have been really happy with. And, you know, I think it's come together great. It's a, yeah, That's an interesting thing too, when you talk about um, putting everything out because Bubblegum, I would say to 99% of the Lanigan fans is the high watermark of Mark Lanigan's career. It is the Tom Petty wildflowers record, you know, meaning that everybody agrees that the Tom Petty wildflowers record is the one, you know, and in that uh, specific, um, you know, case, they held a whole other record out of the Tom Petty wildflowers. And a couple of years ago, they put that thing out after he passed. And I was kind of like, you know, I don't really need these because it was just so incredible. But with this particular one, when I hear these demos, it's a total different animal. 
you know, it's just kind of like, wow, this thing is so sparse and dark and, and haunting. It is land again to me. As I listened to it the first time, I was just kind of like, I was, I had chills in my apartment. I was just like, this is, this is scary. <laughs> you know, like this is him right here. You know, it's, it's like, he's whispering in your ear because, you know, as much as Lanigan didn't give a fuck, you know, it's four in the morning in a hotel. We, he did not want to be interrupted by some <laughs> hotel security if he's, you know, singing too loud. And so you get kind of like that, what I call the Elliot Smith sort of vocal uh, effect where you're just like trying to be as delicate and, and, and vulnerable as, as you can be. Uh, and quiet, you know, and there's something about that quietness that I think is what you're talking about, that there's a haunting sort of like, kind of like a, a very inward look, you know, as as he was singing. And so I, 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 res I responded the same exact way that you're talking about, Dean, because it was like, oh my God, this is like a special thing. I, you know, I think one of the most uh, unexplainable, you know, vibes and feelings I've ever had was when I went out to Rancho the first time. Because as you go out there, it's the most bizarre thing. Because as soon as you get there, you feel like you feel Caius, you feel Queens, you feel Lanigan, and that's just the truth. You get out there and you go what is it out here like that creates this, you know, this insane high level of art. It's so bizarre. Even Greg Dooley with his last record being done out in the same area out there. It's really, it's really mind boggling. And the authenticity of it is just another level, you know? Yeah. When you're out there, you're basically, in the elements, the sun is beating down on you. There's, you know, when, you know, we used to do demos out there for Queens stuff to not, not really demos, more pre-production of just playing. And there used to be no cell service out there. So you've got nothing to distract you. All you have is yourself and like the big open sky. So you're just kind of left like, I, I better make it count. <laughs> it, you might better make it count but also, yeah, there's there's obviously a vibe out there. There's obviously some energy that you're kind of experiencing while you're out there. Um, so yeah, I, I agree with that. It's well, if you don't mind me jumping in, um, all of that, but, right, he started recording this record at Stag Street. Um, right. Right. Originally right. with Chris. And it didn't go very well. He walked away. The, the problem is he had so much time because he'd go back on the road with Queens, be able to listen to stuff and come back to things in different periods of time. So the recording process really stretched out, but he only had so much of a budget as well. So we were able to get Rancho kind of over the Christmas period. I think it was 2002, if I'm, if I'm remembering it correctly. Um, and we had like four days with Josh and we had 10 days, I think, total, um, seven to 10 days total. And at that point, it was crystal meth and whatever else was going on. And, they, and, and when I sat with Josh recently, they went four days straight and right. they got a lot of bubble gum done in that period of time. But we had a we had so much material that it spilled over to. Uh, the uh, Methamphetamine Blues uh, EP. So that ended up being uh, an eight song EP along yeah. with like the 14 song album, along with all of these outtakes that I sat on, plus all of uh, uh, Troy's stuff. So yeah, that's that ends up being the box set, right? But Rancho, I just remember I had to stay there for a couple days at some inn down the street. And just the vibe was just, it was very methy. And yeah. Yeah, you say methy like like you're like a, you're you're like, saying with a lisp. <laughs> it's very, it was very messy. messy. Like, it can be like that too. Well, but I'll what? tell you this. Oh. I'll tell you this. I had a long run with that drug, 
And um, when you're playing music and you're writing music and you've been up for a few days, there are these pockets where some genius comes out. It's dark and it comes out and you grab it. And the rest of the time you are chasing that dark pocket. And that is the demon of meth because you're like, fuck, we, we got this. We better get back to that state of mind. And then you don't and you're frazzled and you're like, we didn't get anything. So it's this weird, weird balance of, um, but there's this other balance where you're in full work mode and concentrating, like, let's fucking get it done. And uh, that is the wildness of that. And when you can put the record on and kind of feel some dark all nighters, that's what really gives it that, that reality, that, that authenticity of like, Holy shit, this is real. <laughs> you know? Well, when we went to go mix the record at sound city with Rick will, he ended up recording more songs. And at that point he was sober. Right. So there's different, you know, dynamics of these recordings based on the time and, the chemistry, you know, literally. And and uh, he'd just pull people in. Oh, I got so-and-so coming uh, at four o'clock with Izzy. You know, it was yeah. Duff and Izzy came to sing on on a song. And I'm like, wow, okay. And then uh, oh, Troy's coming and Nick's coming to do this or that. So it was, pre it was a pretty wild process of making this album. Um, but now listening to it um, in, in this uh, mastered session is incredible because it all now fits. Well, you can really, uh, when you read Josh's, now this comes with the book, I wanna tell everybody once again, and everybody gives their memories of what was going on at the time. And then Josh just drops this incredible, you know, story on there. But to get the call and be like, hey man, and Josh even says, people are gonna be mad, but you know, Lanigan said, this stuff sucks. These people can't play. It sounds like shit. I need your help. And when he gets out there and they, you know, you can tell they're like, we've got to get this thing done. And they just go to work like just two brothers in a war, you know, a war of art and creativity. That is, uh, it's, it's just insane. I, I, I just, I can't say enough how how great this record is. And I am a field songs guy. That's my sure. record. So yeah. everybody was bubblegum and I was always like, field songs, man. What are you talking about? But I'm with you. I, I get that. Yeah. 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 But to get into this entire box set and really feel it in the books and the photos and seeing these these incredible photos of Lanigan. It almost reminds me of um, like some stills from drugstore cowboy or something. It's just got that feel of like old Portland back roads or something. You know, he's always got that look of just like, fuck, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Now, uh, how did the book come together? The photos and everything. Did you guys just, uh, I mean, what was the idea? We're going to put out a double, double album, like 40 songs with the, uh, the, the demos and everything. And then the book. Um, that kind of came, we were looking for some extra, you know, thing to make this package really, really nice. And we were kicking around some ideas. Um, and I knew Steve Gullick really well from way back. I've known him the entire time that I knew Mark and I knew he was one of the only photographers that Mark actually liked, <laughs> that yeah. was allowed to spend time with him. And he didn't just like him, he loved him. Like, like they were incredibly close. Um, and I know at that period in time, he, you know, was one of the only people that was allowed around a lot. And I knew that he would be sitting on some really great unseen stuff. So we, you know, I just threw it out there to him kind of thing. And, uh, you know, Steve has the same kind of grumpy exterior that Mark has, and he bit my head off the first time. <laughs> and then in same fashion, called me back the next day. He was like, I'd love to do this, like kind of. Um, and, you know, very shortly just started kind of pulling all of these incredible pictures out. 
and um some of the stuff you know nobody had ever ever seen before his wife his sister like it was just stuff that you know had been left in steve's studio um again as with troy's demos like kind of that could have been a record on its own steve's thing is good enough to have been a book on its own it, it's it's beautiful yeah it's beautiful um and it encapsulates the vibe of the record through that. You see Mark in that period in time. And um, yeah, he nailed it. It's 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 beautiful. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm really glad that we got that. What I love about Land again, more than anything, is he is the high watermark for me of meeting people at a party. Because if somebody comes up to me and goes, I really like uh, Lanigan or your Lanigan interview or, or bubble gum or something. I'm like, Oh yeah, I'll be talking to this guy. You know, <laughs> he is that kind of artist to me, you know, the Tom Waits, the Lanigan, the Josh Homme, you know, PJ Harvey, Greg Dooley, these type of people that if other people get it, it's it's just on. They're usually people that become my friends for years, which is amazing. And and also what I really loved about Troy, or I mean, um, Mark was his obsession with design, like eyewear, like my eyewear, or boots, or clothing, or music, or guitar. He was obsessed with design, and and you could tell he was obsessed with his music that way because it's just designed so. It's like brutalist. It's like brutalist architecture. You know, it's so fucking real. It's concrete. It's cold. It's warm. It's everything. He would totally have dug, and now I'm going to be anal. And they look like JMM glasses that you're wearing there right now. Yeah. 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 Uh, well, I can I've just catch the glint on the side, and I can't see which model they are, but. Uh, they're walkers, but this yeah. was my, this was the greatest <laughs> part of the first time I've interviewed in land again, because I was really nervous because you're like, you know, shit, how do you talk to land again? You know? So he comes over to the house and we're getting into the first time I saw him. They're playing this uh, Virgin record store in San Francisco on the, uh, on the tour for um, songs from the death. Oh yeah. It's, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> so so Lanigan, he it's a really small room holds like 30 people and there's a side fire uh, emergency thing so Lanigan would just be out there smoking a cigarette and then it was his turn the door would open he'd just come in tree. then he'd just go right back out out there on the side right so I'm talking to him I'm describing he goes yeah fuck all that who makes those glasses yeah, and I never fucking got it. Forgot it. Mid interview. Yeah, fuck all that. Who makes those glasses? And I was like, whoa. And that cracked open the interview because I go, holy shit. Now we're going to talk eyewear. We're going to talk boots. Now, now it's fucking on. And from then on, man, it was always like, yeah, I went down, saw your boy, got the boots. There was, there was such a, a part of that that song to the death tour where it was just about jeans. Yeah. Went to look for fucking jeans. Yeah. And that just became this code word of like, I want to go walking. Yeah. <laughs> Could find whatever, like any store that had jeans and he would just, he would spend hundreds of dollars just just drop a bunch of money on a bunch of jeans. And then I'd have to like help him fucking carry his jeans back to the hotel. But it was always this excuse to like go, you know, and there was no like, there was no like hanging out with Lanigan at a bar. That would never happen. It was yeah. always like, we're gonna go see a movie, we're gonna go get some jeans, and uh, and or we're gonna sit in the back of the back lounge of the bus and smoke cigarettes and not say a lot. <laughs> so yeah, I, I get I, I could see why he would have loved your glasses. Yeah, that's funny. It, it was my favorite moment ever with him. Just fuck all of that. Where'd you get those glasses? Josh told a great story where he was in Japan. 
he gets all these jeans, and then at the end of the tour, he doesn't have anything to put them in, so he just leaves them. Just leaves them in the hotel room. Yeah. I, could, yeah. I couldn't believe it. Like thousands of dollars of jeans. Fuck it, I'm out of here. Yeah. <laughs> always, always, always carried like just, just was always in like a like traveled light. That was his whole thing, you know. And always on a if you're on a plane with him. He would always be the first one to just almost climb over every seat just to get the fuck out of the plane. Yeah. Be the first guy and high step to the fucking security just so he could be out of the whole travel situation and be walking down the street somewhere. Yeah. Yeah, Brian. I didn't. I didn't really. Um, I didn't know the answer to this, but did he tour the Bubblegum record? Oh yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. And, and I quit and, at the end of one of them. <laughs> um, who who I was, was in the totally band? Quitting. Man, well, Troy, I did the first leg, <clears throat> and then um, we were finishing up. I think lullabies, and so I couldn't do the second leg. So Berrigan came in. Michael, well, Berrigan. here's here's where um, I left right before the record came out because it was just it got to be too much for me. But it was the methamphetamine blues era where you started touring it and i remember that's kind of i can't it's it's fuzzy for me but at one point right before the tour i quit and i told him i'd finish it out but and, and I, I met them in seattle troy you were there um and uh i had like at least an exit strategy for every date down the coast until we got back to la just because it was it was like that but uh, yeah, and then but he toured. Uh, I think he toured Bubblegum extensively, didn't he? Very extensively. That's yeah. when we became friends. Was on that tour, um, and I remember the first night we were kind of hanging out, and I'd seen them play. And then I went back about three days later, and we were hanging out, and the band was different. Like, like, and I'm like, what happened? Don't ask. Yeah, don't ask. <laughs> don't ask. Okay, I, oh, I missed that whole part. I'm kind of <laughs> glad I did, but I heard every story because, you know, it was it was basically the same band that I was with. You know, it was like Eddie Nappy and Lauren Block and fucking Brent Netson, and I think Aldo stuck with it because Dooley did the West Coast with you. Yeah, he, he only did the West Coast. He only did the West Coast. We did from Vancouver down to L.A. But the rest of the time was Aldo from Millionaire or, or Creature with a Brain. Um, but it was the same band. It's just I I couldn't do it. So Michael Berrigan came in and, well, Michael Berrigan's girl or wife at the time? Girlfriend. I think. Girlfriend. Yeah. Well, Shelly. And then, yeah, that, that's, that's the beginning of that. So I missed all that. So I don't have the details of what happened there. But I heard, uh, you know, I heard lots of interesting stories. <laughs> it had to be pretty turbulent, right? Oh, very, yeah. Yeah. Very. Yeah. I just, uh, you know, I don't really remember when Bubblegum came out, but does anybody remember what the reviews and the acceptance was from, not the fans, but just, you know, some of the press on it and everything. It was I mean, good. I remember it being pretty favorable. You right. Know, for what any anything that I heard, again, I don't really, you know, I, I try not to pay attention to that kind of stuff. But of course. And when it does come into your realm, you're like, oh, this is pleasant. Usually there's mixed stuff with whatever, you know. Um, but no, I thought it was I thought it was good. Well, I always like to ask that because, you know, so many times the people get it wrong, of course, because they're jackasses. Uh, this sounds contrived and uh, like he's trying to be something. And then years later, like, it's a goddamn masterpiece, you know, and it's very rare where a reviewer will go, I was all wrong about that, you know. It's like me when I bought Octung Baby. I go, this is a piece of shit. Two months later, I go, this is the greatest record I've ever heard, you know, and it's still in my heavy rotation so it's always interesting to look back on that kind of stuff not that it does matter because this was really the one that bonded 
all of the Lanigan fans. I'm, like I said at the beginning of the interview, 90, 95% of the people will say it's bubblegum, you know? Well, I, I mean, I, I couldn't have been a bigger Lanigan Trees fan for many years. I was the last Trees manager. And so as that was kind of going away, <clears throat> Mark asked me to be his solo manager. And I had no idea where it was going to go. But when he, I think joining Queens rubbed off on him, having the time rubbed off on him. Um, and, you know, and then these cast of characters who who came in and made this thing. You Just PJ Harvey on Two Songs was incredible. Yeah. You know? But going back to what Rich was saying earlier about, you know, them talking about making this before he passed, the creepy thing about this was that I save everything. Like Rich mentioned, I saved all of my emails from back then. So as Rich and I are going through all these files and picking songs and thinking about what to do with them or which version of them, I had Mark's feedback at my fingertips while making this thing. And so I'm living in like 2002 and 2003, um, com almost communicating with him. It was really bizarre to like having conversations about the same song with the almost like the same marketing director who was from back then today. And yep. so it was a really heady experience doing all this. And the headiest one was I remembered that there was a song that Mark wrote and he wanted to duet with Beck back then and we were pretty close to getting it done and um one point it just wasn't going to happen so he kind of moved on but the song was recorded and ready to go and it was one of the first things i brought up to rich in this was like man if we can get back on it it would be kind of like a make a wish for him you know and and it was crazy i i sent an email to his manager and then two days later i ran into him i don't why in in the world would i run into him but i did and uh, I, I gave him my like 30 second pitch and he made it happen. And it's just, it's amazing how that went down. So um, yeah, all of that, it was, it, it's kind of, his presence was always there making this thing from like feeling like we're on the right track to, oh yeah, all the crazy shit that never happened the right way because of like whatever chaos was going into his life is still there. You know, so Rich and I kind of just relived all of that kind of stuff. It was crazy. It's amazing to get back on this and finally sing on the track that Lanigan wanted him to sing on because there's this era of Beck Sea Changes, which I think is one of the greatest records ever made, especially from Beck once that comes out, which is a heavy type of Lanigan vibe record. You mm. know, like it's almost like to see those two do a record together in a sea changes Lanigan flavor would have been mind boggling, you know? Well, he, he really likes sea change. I remember him liking mutations and I'm pretty sure one foot in the grave. So that was kind of this combination of what ended up being the song, you know, I think. Of course, yeah. of course. Now, um, is he straddling? I mean, this is a guy who's been a goddamn ghost since 92. I mean, I know Duff gets him going, but was Mark friends with Izzy? Not really, no, but he loved Izzy, um, loved guns. Um, he was very close with Duff. They were very good friends, you know, for you know, the last 30 years or so. Um, but I remember him call, coming outside of uh, Sound City and we're outside sitting on a bench. He's like, Okay, I think I've got I got Duff coming down, Izzy, and then he was trying to get Slash. I'm like, what are you, are you trying to reform Guns and Roses? Yeah, and um, but it was only uh, Duff and Izzy. But Izzy ended up kind of co-singing um, "Strange Religion" with him, and it turned out really cool. I, I think I have a version of it without him and a version with him, and um, yeah, it was just really kind of like a Keith Richards kind of like. Uh, you know, not quite in key kind of vocal it was really cool. Yeah, that Juju Hound stuff that Izzy did was unbelievable. It was obviously heavily influenced by Talk Is Cheap, which is one of the greatest uh, non Stones Stones records ever. Absolutely. But you know, Izzy and and Lanigan together that would have been an amazing uh, combination, also. Yeah, 
Yeah. Um, yeah, I think it was only that afternoon they spent together. And Izzy, I remember Izzy sitting outside with us with his dog. I think he always had a dog with him. But um, yeah, kind of hung out with his dog and it was like, yeah, it was like seeing a ghost. I don't I don't even know how you could even get anything done because I would be like, oh, where the fuck have you been? What do you do? I would have just been talking to him, you know, because there's a story Duff told me there, like, uh, you know, I think it was Velvet Revolver were on tour and they're like in Germany and they get a knock on the tour bus and it's Izzy. He's just out on a bicycle touring Europe on a bike. And he goes, hey, I'll jump on the bus. He just leaves his bike there. It's like that kind of stuff is, I mean, Izzy is just like, what? You know, so to get on, to get him on this record, you know, at the time, he was barely even playing music. Yeah, I don't know. I think I was the only one sitting out there with him, just like, you know, him and his dog for like an hour or so while they were doing this. And I can't remember the conversations, but it was definitely some of that. Yeah. yeah. Now, hey, uh, for a walkabout kind of, because I, I, I played on one of Dust records a few years ago. And he stopped by, and this was at Pink Duck, the Queen studio. Um, and he literally had a van and a dog. And in between takes, he would just go out to the van with an open door, like no shoes, his dog, just just being like a, a dude in a van. That is- and He disappeared, he just like left. So, that, that guy, I don't well, think there's anyone more like I mean, let's see the documentary. You know, it's just so wild. Good luck. Yeah. I, I know. Right? He kind of like, doesn't think he's being. Yeah, he just he probably doesn't think he's being mysterious, but he he just is, right? Yeah, yeah. Now, okay, so the box set is out. I tell everybody, uh, get this. It's in a CD form, or two uh, LP form with a book. You get the uh, you get the demos. You get everything. It's in the stores now, right? Well, it's four LP. So right. Oh yeah, yeah, right. Actually, Rich, Rich, maybe you can tell him just what. But Mark I'm saying the actual in. bubble gum is two LPs, and then sorry, we, yeah, 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 yeah. And then we've got um, we've got the uh, methamphetamine blues, which we rounded out from an EP to an LP on this, and then um, the final, the unreleased material, which. Uh, Rich, I, I don't know. Maybe you want to talk about the way what Mark felt about the original LP, and then also our <laughs> choice to put Troy's um, side on to end it because I think that was a late choice for us. Yeah, we switched it around at the last minute. I mean, <clears throat> one of the main motivations to do this was to make right the fact that Mark hated the original vinyl pressing of Bubblegum, hated it because wow. it was on single vinyl. And it was compressed, like, so it was so fucking quiet and, like, shitty sounding. And, like, for years, he would just complain about how shitty the bubblegum vinyl was. So one of the main things to make right was to get that done. If Even if we hadn't done anything else, just to get that recut as a double was, like, important. Um, now I want to I want to stress why that probably was because that was a CD era, hmm. vinyl was not hot again, so they yeah. would usually just master it off the glass master instead of the analog tapes, and it would just sound like shit. They just yeah. go here if you want vinyl, there it is, you know. Nobody was like, oh, vinyl. Now, of course, it gets the proper double LP because it gets the big grooves. And you get the full fucking sound. And it really works great with Mark's voice. It's just like, oh. but go well, ahead. I just wanted to. That was it. And that was, the, I mean, it was about wanting to make that sound good for him. And at the same time, there was a little bit of completion of some of his other like wishes, like before he passed, the few months before, um, you know, we just started to set up doing his new record and he wanted to go to Abbey Road and make it. Like he wow. never did before and that was like a big thing and he went to see jeff at heavenly about it all and like we were going to go into to abbey road and cut the next record wow um and it just never happened so to go and take this record into abbey road and kind of finish it all in there i also thought helped take that full circle a little bit and 
we got to go in and cut all of the uh the bonus material you know um and get that mastered and get it sounding good and at the same time you know cutting the vinyl onto double we weren't really going to fuck with the mastering on bubblegum because it was so perfect you know it just had that raw like sound to it and it's like don't mess with something so perfect that people have lived with for a long time because all you're going to do is bum people out That's oh right. yeah believe yeah. me um and as we were running it through just like you know i've worked with jeff there for years and he's incredible and just the tiny little tweaks that he put on his voice just to shoot it lifted it just the slight little touches that he added to it were incredible as well you know like it's like let's not fuck this like kind of it's perfect the way it is um but yeah, just that tiny, like it, it takes, it's a great guy like Jeff who isn't going to come in and try and change everything and do it. It's like, no, like just, you know, little finesse here and there. And he, that whole thing now sounds incredible. Yeah, that's fucking great. So it was all done in Abbey Road, huh? Yeah, we went and did it all in Abbey Road over a couple of days. Um, you know, it, it's based on the fact that that's where we were going to do the next record. Did you bring the original two inches out to Abbey Road? <laughs> no, no. We we uploaded everything and got it all kind of done there, kind of. Gotcha. Um, well, the we, yeah, we got everything kind of super high res and kind of, um, uh, we, you know, we cut the plates for the vinyl in there as well. That They've got the big lacquer machine. and Wow. That was important, yeah. Yeah. You know, that's we did, cool i did everything in there it was great but that last disc you really called it yeah as far yeah. as the sides and sequence yeah i was like we need to just kind of move it around the very last minute it was the other way around on the um for ages you know it was kind of the demos and then the bonus tracks on the end and i'm like no like kind of they should be grouped with the rest of the record and then it needs to close on the intimacy of those demos. And that should be your last, you know, kind of memory of the whole thing. And as soon as we just flipped those two sides over, everybody was just like, yeah, like this really works now. Well, that's immediately where I went to yeah. when, when I got it. I, I know the record and I, okay, I'm going to listen to bubble go. This is, this is a new land again record right here to me, yeah. you know? Oh, yeah. let's let's hear this right now. And then, like I said, he was just in the apartment. I was like, whoa, whoa. It took me a few minutes as I was reading the book. I was gone. The words of Troy and Josh. And and then, of course, Chris Gospian, uh, one of my all time favorites of, of the history of the desert. I mean, he is the grand poobah of the desert. So it's all my favorite criminals together you know, they're, they're, it's a gang that has always been artistically the highest level so just to to have this whole thing in one package and the words of each person that was there that's really what makes it too especially in this goddamn world of just streaming and and that shit it's those days of sitting down with a record and reading the people's words that were there what they were thinking, what Mark was thinking, where it was recorded. It's, it's just beautiful. Yeah. I couldn't agree more. You know, when I look at the vinyl and I'm just like, I just, I just wanted to dive in and just go, there's a book. It's yeah. tangible. It's like you put the record on and you just, you just lose yourself. And there's not much of that going on. You're right these days, you know, um, you know, it's like if you hear about some new band or some new artist, somebody sends you a link to Apple Music or Spotify, and you're just like, okay, you know, where do I find the vinyl? <laughs> like, yeah. I want to if it's if it's if it catches me, yeah, I'll, I, I would like to touch something, you know, uh, tangible. So, I, that's 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 how I feel about the box set. It's really and the photos. You're right, man. Just I, I I saw photos that I never thought I would 
see, you know, like him and me on stage. Like I never saw anybody take photos <laughs> during those tours. You know, I'm like, it takes me straight back to like those, that period. And, and looking at the, the scans of the notebook pages are incredible. Because yeah. I know those notebook pages, they were scribbled on constantly. Yeah. Like, yeah, while, while you're, Look like, at that. like while you're talking to him about some idea, you know, and, and you're making that idea, you're just capturing an idea, you're capturing gold out of thin air, you know. It's, it's yeah, to be a part of, of this, and I'm, I'm really glad that this all came together because you know, it makes me, you know, it chokes me up in many ways, but also makes me feel super lucky and uh, privileged to be in the room at that time. And, and not even really, because when you're working, you're not thinking about any of this stuff. And sometimes t time takes, time takes a while, you know, <laughs> and you, you basically, you know, when, when you end up with, with something special like this, all these B-sides and all these other pieces, you know, to share it with everybody and to get a reaction like, like you're talking about, it, it just, you know, fills me with emotion and makes me feel, you know, blessed. So uh, I appreciate what you're saying about this team because, you, you know, you're, you're a fan and you're, you're a real true music uh, lover and, and, and uh, I appreciate it. Thank you. Oh, man, it's, you know, I just feel that we are lucky that we have people like Lanigan and, and Josh and, and, you know, everybody that was on this, and especially you, man. I mean, you've, I always looked at Troy as a, like the ultimate weapon in a band. You just go like, oh, yeah, they got Troy. So we're going to get some interesting rad shit here tonight so it's amazing that you're part of this history too it's just i just i don't think i can really stress enough how high of a mark this music is to me and a lot of people you know i mean somebody emailed me yesterday and they go uh they're in ireland and they go i just got the bubblegum box now i gotta find a cd player to 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 play it, you know, like he didn't even care. He was going to get the player later. <laughs> yeah. sure. it was just awesome, man. You know, well, I'll say I'm incredibly grateful to Rich for, you know, uh, going with this idea and then, and Troy who, you know, um, for having this material and, and just the memories, you know, of, of all this as well. And, you know, I had a very hard time listening to this record when it came out for personal reasons. Sure. And this was a this was a way for me to get back to it and finish it the right way and feel good about it finally. You know, so personally, that that was my kind of journey on this. You know, and but I'll I tell got, you, the, I'll tell you this right now, and I owe Lan again until the day I die. He was one that really put the credibility to my podcast. Uh, you know, of course, up until then, I was interviewing amazing people. Uh, but once you tell people, yeah, I've had Lanigan on, they're like, what? Yeah, Lanigan did it? He didn't, That guy doesn't do anything. So True. <laughs> I, I will spread the word of that man for the rest of my life because, uh, you know, like I said before, he's just... The real fucking deal. Yeah, I, I it's funny because <laughs> it's like I, I I never really sat down to read his uh, his book, uh, the first book. I'm spacing on the name, of course, but but when I'm driving, I like to listen to his his book on tape of him basically telling his stories. And yeah. it's, to me, it's some of the best. Like I could listen to it for days and just keep it on repeat. And it's just because you're, because his voice, it's, you know, I, and I'll use, I'll use something that, that Josh used to say all the time that I thought was funny. If Lanigan sang about toothpaste, I would brush 
all day long. You know? Yeah. So <laughs> yeah, I, I love that, that quote. That's that's basically how I feel about his voice. You know, it's him. There's no denying it. You know, and and for our generation, that is a voice that I think, as the years go on, people are going to realize. And 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 his him being so prolific, it's it's like it's going to keep going. There's more stuff. There is more stuff. He kept, that was the one thing he was constantly working. And that's one thing that he inspired me to try and be was like, just keep, keep doing what you do. If you have a voice, just do it. And, and, and some stuff may take years to finish, you know, some, some, some things might not ever come out. Maybe it's some things might not, ever be good enough but to to have it and to have document it that to me uh it was important to learn that from him rich you said you were talking about maybe going into abbey road with him are there demos from that stuff that didn't uh, get recorded there's the whole record is demoed wow thing is done yeah uh he recorded the whole thing um you yeah, know just as I like a lot of it is just uh, into his iPhone. It's him, a guitar, and his iPhone, like kind of. But the whole song, uh, the whole of that record was assembled, and he knew exactly what he wanted it to be. That's that's another thing. There was there was this sort of like you wouldn't expect it, you know, by by knowing him that he had this all in his a lot of this in his head. Yeah, and that genius of, of Mark Lanigan. There's a simplicity. No doubt, but it was, it was, there was, you're right. There's, I think design is a, is a good, it's a great word for it because it's not just, you know, some church chords and a guy singing. It's, it's really well, um, well crafted. Yeah. Rich, I mean, Rich is in a band with him. I mean, they're, they work together as well. They're in Soul Savers. Rich is Soul Savers. So, yeah. I'm sure, he's got a lot of that. Some of my favorite records. Yeah. I yeah. loved hearing Lanigan sing on the uh, on those tracks specifically because I knew his taste. You know, he really loved that kind of gospel, but also modern. You know, he was very like Lanigan turned me on so much music, and he would just buy. This is he was one of the first people that I knew that had an iPod. Wow, like five gigs in white and like. And I, I was like, he would just buy, like jeans, he would just buy CDs, burn them, put them in his computer on the iPod. He had like several iPods. And he would just give me the CDs when he was, he was like, I'm done with this. <laughs> and I was like, wow, this is cool. Like, I, I he turned me on to Towns Van Zandt. I'd never heard of Towns Van Zandt back then. Yeah. So, you know, just stuff like that. It would just be constantly listening to music constantly reading and just a wealth of of poetry and knowledge yeah so there's there there's got to be more i'm sure there is it's like a hidden tupac track every <laughs> you know <laughs> machiavelli machiavelli marcavelli <laughs> no, all right guys it's a lot so. thank you so much for doing the show today and uh, I really appreciate it. I love this box set, and it was great to see you guys, especially Troy. I haven't seen you in a few months or whatever, but uh, a great Thanks, meeting you, Rich. And uh, everybody go out and buy this. It's out right now. Uh, just the book alone is, is worth it with the photos and, and the people's uh, memories of Mark. And uh, spread the word on it, people. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thanks, Dean. Great to see you all. Yeah, man. And I will, uh, I will see you guys soon out there on the highway. You got it, brother. All right, guys. Take All care. Right. See ya.